uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I'm recording it, but I'm not happy with if the recording takes place the way I see it, the way I see the screen is not going to be a good recording because I have now two tasks bar two task bars that I cannot get rid of them. Uh, so anyway, I move. Jean Nouvel, French, born the 12th of August 1945. Yes, he's a French architect. Nouvel studied at the Ecole des Beaux Arts in Paris and was a founding member of Mars. I don't know what Mars is. 1976, a syndicat, syndicat de l'architecture. Uh, he, he has obtained a number of prestigious, prestigious distinctions over the course of his career including the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. Technically, the prize was awarded for the Institut du Monde Arabe, which Nouvelle designed, the Wolf Prix Prize in Arts in 2005, and the Pritzker Prize in 2008. A number of museums and architectural centers have presented retrospectives of his work. And this was the man, I mean, this is the man, um, I like Jean Nouvel. In my opinion, he is the best French architect, and he might even be the best European architect. And his, his name says it all, Nouvel. Uh, maybe the Latins were right when, when they said, nomen est omen, the name is destiny. And he was and is a man who promotes the new, and he does it convincingly, rigorously, and incessantly. Um, so he wanted to study first art, painting, but he was not accepted in the, in the, in the art school. So he studied architect, architecture. Now I think he doesn't regret and he doesn't have reasons to regret because he's immensely successful. So successful that he moved to the Southern France and there bought a castle, something, uh, you know, immense again. And, uh, he is a, a very colorful life, extremely creative with lots of commissions. And uh, this is a, an earned life. Of course, not everybody has this chance, but he's a, a, an example that it is possible. Uh, and um, so there is a lot to say. He had um, a, a mentor and that is Claude Parent. Uh, an interesting um, architect who, who died a few years ago. Uh, and uh, Claude Parent was, was an architect who advocated the diagonal, the sloping plane. And uh, the diagonal indeed is, the, is the, the sign of, in a way, a rebelliousness, but also life. Now, we begin the presentation with L'Institut du Monde Arabe, an early work. Uh, uh, and uh, it is for this work that he received the, the, the prestigious Aga Khan Award, uh, a prize usually offered to, to, I mean, it's offered in the Islamic world and to, to works um, done by, usually by uh, architects from Islam. Uh, and it's an excellent award. Uh, in, in my opinion, some of the works uh, awarded uh, by uh, Aga Khan um, are uh, probably <laughs> more important than, than some of the works um, um, advocated and promoted by Pritzker. Anyway, this is my opinion. And I'm very happy that uh, the, the prize Aga Khan exists. And I'm also happy that um, Jean Nouvel received it. Although this work is, um, anyway, we'll see it. Uh, here are some CAD uh, drawings of it. It's across the Seine from uh, uh, Notre Dame de Paris, the well-known uh, cathedral. I have been on the terrace of this building. It's a very metallic building. It's a, it's a, it's a building which says yes to technology, to modernity, but also has references to, um, to Islam. And uh, that's, that's a quality that, uh, that Jean Nouvel has, that even in his most audacious works, he connects with something from the place he builds in or with the culture that he's referring to. So, so his work is not, is not saying no to context. 
sometimes to the metaphysical context, sometimes to the physical context. But there is a slight, maybe not much more than slight connection, uh, oblique connection with uh, what we call uh, a certain context, a part of, a, of, of context. <clears throat> like here, you know, this, this, this panel, which, which was very expensive to create, it's a reference to, to the Arab world, but, but uh, from what I read, uh, you know, sometimes it malfunctions and uh, uh, this is supposed to, he, you know, uh, electronically supposed to, you are supposed to, to be able to adjust the, the opening of these, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the largeness or smallness of these openings Sometimes they don't work and it costs a lot to repair them. And I understood uh, large amounts of money had been put uh, for this extravagant, uh, uh, extravagant, but, uh, but uh, not uh, unjustifiable, um, uh, you know, uh, feature, aesthetical feature in the building. It's a, you can see it's a, it's a high tech building, but also has almost a traditional touch to it because of this, I forgot the, what is the Arab word, uh, word for, for this, something with M, the word, but uh, I, I regret I forgot. Anyway, he inspired himself from the Arab world because this is l'Institut du Monde Arabe, the, the Institute of the uh, Arab world. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a good work because, you know, it's, again, it's a modern work, it's a metallic work, it's a high-tech work, but also, when you look at it, you feel the connection with, uh, with, uh, with the Arab world and, and it is destined to the Arab world. It is gray indeed. Now you see here, just like in, a, in an old fashioned camera, you know, uh, maybe not only old fashioned, I'm not, I'm not very no bit, no knowledgeable about cameras, but you, you, you modify the aperture uh, mechanically or electronically in order to let more or less light into the building. Uh, it's a screen, but this screen uh, is very sophisticated and crafted beautifully. Uh, you can see it's almost, almost arts and crafts, but uh, uh, high-tech arts and crafts. And you can see from the outside, I hope I, I, hope I have here pictures uh, where various openings are, like for example, here, it's much smaller than here. So, you know, these are controlled from somewhere within the building in order to let light be filtered in accordance with the ones, uh, I mean, with some people's desire. So, well, this is a feature which is uh, uh, functional, is technical, is high tech even, but it's also ornamental. This should not be forgotten. It is ornamental and it refers to a, to a tradition of the ornament in the world that this building is trying to honor and serve. It's very ingenious. Unfortunately, it, 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 it was very expensive. And from what I read, it doesn't function perfectly. It has problems, but anyway, uh, he tried. L'Institut du Monde Arabe, Jean Nouvel. Now, uh, this apartment in Las Boas, this is a project that it, he didn't build, but I, 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 I decided to include it in the presentation because it shows somehow, well, on one hand, Jean Nouvel is uh, uh, an architect quite capable of surprising continuously because he uses, um, he, he's, he's not really, a, he's not a signature architect. And he is very explorative and experimental. Like here, you see, he uses um, an abundance of color uh, and uh, he, sometimes he's uh, seduced and, uh, and uh, able to seduce by, um, by um, uh, even by surrealism, I would say, 
by, uh, you know, uh, an artistic exuberance, which is very close to surrealism, like here. But this was not built. But we'll see other works where he uses, uh, um, you know, color uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in very pictorial and engaging and uh, even puzzling ways. Now, this, this work, Nemosis, Nemosis apartment building in Nîmes, is an early work, which uh, I think you like, and I like it too. It's done, you know, with almost with prefabricated elements, something you would buy from a, from a you know, a, a speak store, department store with the construction materials and put them together. It's 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 very innovative. I mean, how many apartment buildings in the world look like this one? It's like there are two buildings like ships, uh, metallic indeed. What is interesting here is that he um, and here you know he. I have a, a close relationship to 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 Jean Nouvel. I even wrote an essay about his uh, works. I intended to read it today, but I didn't want to tire you because it's, it will be a rather long presentation. Uh, but if you want, any of you who wants to read it, I could send it to you. I wrote, I wrote it after I attended a lecture by Jean Nouvel uh, in New York many years ago. And uh, he, he claimed then at the lecture that he loved architecture with plural, archite architectures with an S, a plural. And he seemed to be democratically um, oriented. Well, there is a paradox that here in these buildings, he, um, he was a little bit totalitarian in other, because he invited some artist friends to uh, create some, I don't know how to call them, let's call them artworks on the concrete walls of the building which the, the inhabitants were not allowed to change. And this to me was a little bit uh, anti-democratic, but uh, uh, you'll see the artworks, they're not bad. Um, so this is the plan of, of this is an early work by, by Jean Nouvel. And uh, I think it's interesting uh, and uh, it works. I mean, you know, you compare these buildings with uh, what is around here and they stand out and they stand out because they are architectures, indeed. In my opinion, Jean Nouvel doesn't always create very profound works, but uh, most of the time his works are um, uh, subtle, engaging, uh, provocative, and uh, they don't follow also, he, he's rather unique, I would say, Jean Nouvel. Um, you know, some people might compare him with another Pritzker laureate from France, that is Christian de Porzon Park. In my opinion, Jean Nouvel is a superior, is a better architect than Christian de Porzon Park. But they both received the Pritzker Prize. I also think, in my opinion, that he is a better architect than Lacaton and Vassal, who are also French and who also received the, the Pritzker Prize. Why do I say this? Because I think Jean Nouvel understood and understands that even when you have social concerns, and in this case he does, he also has an artistic side that sometimes is capricious, sometimes is maybe even wrong, but, but that side, uh, is connected inevitably with architecture. He's more colorful, only, not only uh, metaphorically, but also literally. Uh, he's, uh, he takes risks. His architecture is not only gray and metallic. Yes, he uses metal. Uh, yes, he uses steel, but he uses other materials as well, even rusted steel. He's not dogmatic, really. Uh, and uh, yeah.
I mean, you, you know, you look at this picture and you wonder what is it, you know, it's something at NASA or it's an apartment building and probably almost a social housing complex in me, Nîmes. It's not, it's not made for the rich. And now you, you'll have a chance to, to see what I was talking about. Um, uh, so these are the apartments uh, and you see, these are the artworks you know uh, these almost scribblings these graffitis on the on the on, on the concrete which were done by artists that he invited uh, and uh, now that i look at them i think that perhaps it's not bad that um, you know they were you know it is a little bit imposing on on the on the inhabitants to have them because not everybody might like them but on the other hand I mean, I don't know. They are part of the anatomy of the building. They are part of what the the the, build, the apartments are. So they came together with a package. Apartments make better places to work than offices. That's what Jean Nouvel said. Uh, and he also said, Jean Nouvel, that uh, um, ideally we should bring the office into the home and the home into the office. So here we see uh, an alchemical attempt to unite the opposites, the home with the office. And I think it's a good, uh, it's a good attempt. And uh, I think today, because of the pandemic, we do it inevitably so. Now, Saint Jean Hotel, uh, this is near Paris. Um, this is a, a very French hotel, so to speak. It's a cage of rusted iron but it has some interesting aspects. Uh, for example, the, the walls of the bathrooms in some, in some cases, not in all the cases, are totally glass. I mean, totally transparent. But I like this, this uh, you know, embroidered facade of a rusted iron. It's ra uh, rash rational and even rationalistic, but because of the, of the, of the fine uh, texture and uh, and uh, the you know the miniature openings into the into the grid of the of the steel, I think it has a, a, a sub subtleness. But but uh, here is the you know I, I call it the French side of Jean Nouvel. He made um, the the apart the the hotel rooms are very clinically designed as you can see. You know look, you know it's. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it, 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 you, you wonder, are you in a hospital or some kind of a, or sci some kind of a science fiction uh, uh, environment? It's, um, I could comment a little bit uh, psychoanalytically about this interior, but I will abstain now. The curious thing is, let me see if, uh, no, I have to show this, but I don't know if I have, I only have this picture. He made um, the, the walls that separate the bathroom from the room itself, in some cases, not in all the cases, completely of glass. And, uh, you know, when he was asked, why did he do that? He said to promote uh, conversation. But, uh, you know, usually a bathroom is uh, a place of, uh, you know, uh, intimacy and, Anyway, he did it as an experiment, and uh, I don't know if it worked or if it didn't. So it's also when you look at the outside, you wouldn't expect the inside, this inside. I think this hotel is connected with a vineyard or uh, it has something to do with, uh, you know, with this, but I think it's a good work by uh, and 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 uh, uh, sacred touch, so to speak, with the spire of the church, which of course was not designed by him, adds something perhaps to the. And look at his smile. This is a man who, um, uh, anyway, moving forward, the Paris Philharmonia. This is a newer work by him, and I saw it in Paris, and uh, it impressed me. Uh, because of his handling of, uh, of, of the ornament. Uh, look at this. This is a work, yes, he had troubles with this work because uh, there were uh, lawsuits against him by the city. It was a very high budget. It was not respected. 
it went over the budget, there were all kinds of complications, but he built it. And um, it's not far away from La Villette, the park by uh, Bernard Chumi. Uh, but this skin, the skin of the building, metallic as it is, because it is ornamental, is mysterious. It's almost, you know, it becomes almost organic, although it is metallic. Uh, again, you know, it's an it's a work which which takes you by surprise and and and, and he's very good at this you know he understands that architecture also has to engage one you know and it's a visual art you, you, you know it's important that the building is provocative and it's interesting it's inciting and enticing and this building is Plus, it's connected. I mean, look at it. If you didn't know what it was from far away, it's 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 very surprising. It's some kind of a strange animal that has in its corner the announcements, uh, you know, about the, the events within the Philharmonic uh, Philharmonia. But it, it is some kind of a Leviathan, cultural Leviathan, some kind of a cultural Moby Dick. It's, it's this huge. Uh, you know, uh, organism. It's not the warmest building in the world. I had been there and it was closed and, you know, it's so much metal. It, 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 it is a cold building, but uh, aesthetically it's still um, uh, provocative and, uh, and engaging. I keep saying, when I look at these pictures, I see a confirmation of the fact that architecture at its best is an adventure. If it is not an adventure, well, you know, the, the level of satisfaction can only go so far. It has to be an adventure. Now I understand not every building can, can, can arrive at this altitude of being adventurous, but I think architects feel accomplished when they are able to transmit emotions and when they are able to invent, to create. And look at this, look at the skin of this animal. You know, at first you don't quite understand what is going on here, you know, and, and this is a creation. It's, 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 it, look at these people uh, assembling the, the parts, which are so different, you know, and they are not Cartesian. And it's, it's, it's a miniature work. It's a, it's a decorative work. It's an ornamental work. It's a work which has to do with the pleasure of, uh, of creating things which are visually uh, <clears throat> stimulating. I mean, he didn't have to do this, right? Uh, why did he do it? You know, you almost see a bird motif here, you know, and but it's abstracted. And when it comes together at a large scale, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Here he is, you know, we're talking with, um, you know, the official, the authorities, because as I said, he had troubles, judicial troubles with Paris, with the city of Paris. Uh, but, uh, you know, he can afford to even fight with Paris at this point. Uh, here he's with, uh, um, with Zaha Hadid, uh, friends. And, you know, I look at this picture and, and it saddens me beyond measure that we have thousands of students of architecture and thousands of architects who are not moved by such a picture. Here we have two brilliant architects and they are brilliant architects. Zaha was a brilliant architect. And you, you can tell that there is a, a, a communication between them. And, and, and this, it, it's also an invitation towards excellence. And, 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 and the indifference towards excellence that I see around me saddens me beyond measure. Because, because unless you aspire towards excellence, what do you do with your life as an architect? Here, we have an architect who created something. Okay, you might like it, you might not like it, but you cannot be indifferent to it. Look what he did. You know, this is a unique building. And it's unique not just because of this ornamental uh, uh, treatment of the facade, Bravo to him. Again, I was there and it's 
you know, it is a coal building, but because of the ornamental side of it, what we look at now, uh, it, it escapes, uh, you know, uh, the negative connotations of what cold means. It's interesting. It's an interesting work. Uh, here, I, I guess it's still during construction, but uh, anyway, people are still in line. This was before the pandemic, of course. Yeah, he had troubles with this building, but uh, that's what that's what happens when you take risks. John Woodson also had troubles with the opera in Sydney and other architects, you know, uh, it's inevitable. But again, this to me is an example of architecture as adventure. Of course, from a sustainable point of view, from the point of view of sustainability, uh, this is not a building that uh, was concerned with this issue. It's true. But maybe for some representative buildings with a great civic uh, impact and importance, uh, we can, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, accept even excess, maybe. Anyway, it was built before. Um, you know, the high concerns with what is actually a pressing issue in the present, and that is sustainability. Here is uh, Napoleon of Architecture, Jean Nouvel, now Louvre in Abu Dhabi, which you probably saw published. It was published uh, extensively. Here again, I think he is very good at embroidering uh, 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 skin, uh, an architectural skin which filters light. In, a, in an almost impressionistic way. He's very good at it. But in my opinion, in this work, there is something which is, which is not at its best. It's the fact that this covering, which is so sensitively done in, in terms of filtering the light, uses a very perfect circular, and in my opinion, authoritative uh, form, which is uh, placed uh, on top of a uh, bazaar-like uh, configuration underneath. In my opinion, this almost represents ideologically, and now I maybe follow the, the path uh, already traced by Aaron Besky, who criticized uh, Tadao Ando uh, for his latest work in Paris, which in his opinion uh, illustrates, you know, the French colonialism. Here I see kind of something similar. This. In my opinion, this should not have been like this, you know, perfectly, uh, you know, circular and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, centripetal. Uh, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's artificial. It's not, it's, it's, it's an imposition on what is underneath, but the way the light goes through it is magnificent. Too bad that it is uh, configured in this way, in my opinion because it is like a curtain, but the curtain is never like this, you know, it's so geometrically contained. It's very rigid, in my opinion. It's really uh, like, um, how do you call that thing, the cover of a pot, you know, you just, you just put the cover on the, on the pot, and, and, but the pot in this case is, is the, the, the cultural bazaar, which he was inspired to create. It's some kind of a contradiction, but, but the way he filters light through it is, I think, magnificent. Although, of course, it, is, it was probably very expensive, but uh, they have money there, you know, thanks to, thanks to the gas, thanks to the oil. In my opinion, it's an almost perfect work. But because of the, the um, perfect circularity of the, uh, of, of the covering, uh, it, it, it fails, in my opinion. It's, I'm surprised he didn't realize this. Because, the, you know, it's, in my opinion, it's an imposition on what is underneath. Yes, when the light, when you see the light through it and you don't see it from above, you don't see the limits, it's fine. It works fine and even beautifully. But from above, it's, uh, in my opinion, you know, there was a French um, 
cultural, uh, well, not really a theoretician. I don't know how to call him. A cultural personality in France, Boileau, who said, uh, <clears throat> l'esprit de géométrie and l'esprit de finesse, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fineness. Here, in my opinion, uh, here is the spirit of fineness. And uh, uh, this is the spirit of geometry, but I think the spirit of geometry here at the level of this roof is overwhelming the, 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 the architectural curtain, the fine embroidery that he achieved here, in, in, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, it, it was an ex again an expensive, very expensive enterprise. Uh, and uh, if it wasn't so, authoritative, uh, it would have been great. But anyway, the French do have this uh, almost uh, unesca inescapable, unescapable, uh, unavoidable, um, it, it's probably in their psychology, you know, there wasn't, there were emperors, there were kings in France, they love liberté, égalité, fraternité, but I also think they have some kind of a um, yes paradoxical paradoxical liking of of the king the 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 um, the emperor the emperor and and you know he, this is what I see in this perfect shape it's it's uh, the love of centrality you know like in Paris you have l'Arc de Triomphe you have the convergence of all boulevards towards the l'Arc de Triomphe it's too triumphalist and but. Yeah, I, I love what he did inside, <clears throat> but I don't love the periphery. It should not have been so contained. It should have been kind of like the edges of uh, the Holocaust Memorial by Peter Eisenman in Berlin, which are uh, fragmented uh, towards the edge. But um, anyway, Jean Nouvel is not, uh, is not Peter Eisenman. But not in all his works, he does this. But as you can see, in, in, uh, if you relay this work to L'Institut du Monde Arabe, there also he was able to, to uh, manipulate light in sophisticated ways and even sensitive ways. And he does the same thing here. Yeah, maybe he wanted this effect of some kind of an unidentified flying object but why would he do that? You know, um, yes, this is the Louvre Museum. Yes, it has to do with the French culture. But, um, and yes, it is in the Arab world. And, and yes, this embroidering connects with the Arab world. Mm. But the shape of the rear roof, and with this, I will end about this, I think connects more with um, the love for cent of, of centrality in, uh, in, the, in the French culture. Which, on the other hand, as I said, promoted the fall of Bastille and uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, which means breaking the breaking the rules, breaking the authority. But here he goes uh, along well with the authority, as you can see. They are both happy, although, you know, the man on the right paid a fortune for this uh, extravaganza. And look at the workers, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we, see, the, we see the final result, but, uh, you know, to arrive there, can you imagine the, the, the magnitude of the effort, the complexity of the work? Bravo to them. Look at this. In a way, I mean, this is on a curved surface, what he did on a flat surface on the facades of L'Institut du Monde Arabe. It is the same spirit and the same architect. Again, architecture is an adventure, and it was an adventure, an expensive adventure, it's true. Well, adventures are usually expensive, if not in a financial way, in terms of, you know, uh, the exhaustion that sometimes you go through in order to survive the, the adventure. But uh, this is almost like uh, the, the twins that uh, Leonardo da Vinci talked about 
the twins, pain and pleasure. You cannot have one without the other. That's what Leonardo da Vinci said, that uh, pain and pleasure are twins. Now, this is a tower he built. We are going to arrive at it in, in Barcelona. Tour Icon Lyon. This is in Lyon, uh, in the center of France. Uh, he built it. This is just a project. I, I had this presentation made a few years ago. I have to make a new one to, pick, to keep up with this man. You see here the insinuation of the color. He's, you can tell that he is a closet painter. He, he didn't practice the art of painting. He didn't enter the, the art of Beaux-Arts, but you know, there is besides being, having a, a, an architect in himself very much. So there is also a painter and he, uh, he problematizes the geometry of his buildings sometimes through pictorial means. La Confluence, this was built in this area in Lyon where, um, you know, also uh, Wolf Prix and uh, Kopp Himmelblau built uh, uh, the Musée de Confluence. This is a nice word, confluence, you know, confluences, meaning conjunction, conjunction between uh, disparate uh, even fields or disciplines or whatever. It's about unity, but multiplicity in unity. Voici la future tour à la confluence. Anyway, this is, uh, you know, uh, the agency, real estate agencies uh, making uh, publicity for the building. Vent d'exception, rendezvous au cube orange. Cube orange, which was built by uh, uh, an interesting atelier or, uh, yeah, of, uh, architecture office, uh, Jacob and McFarlane very interesting works. I don't know if I have uh, here the orange cube. I hope I do, but I don't know. Anyway, even this tower by um, tower, not a very tall tower by, uh, by Jean Nouvel, shows his ability to, to, to problematize the, the serene uh, prism, to break it apart, to, um, you know, uh, he didn't quite succeed in doing this, in my opinion, at the Louvre uh, Museum in Abu Dhabi, but he succeeded here. Uh, you know, it, it, the idea is to, 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 to disperse the harshness of the limits of the prism and create a, a building which is both uh, uh, um, uh, self-contained and open, and thus fragile, thus vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Uh, please be kind of the microphone. Uh, thank you. Okay, so we move forward. He is in Lyon here uh, with an apartment building. Uh, he did something similar in New York City, and we are going to arrive at that building. Again, what we see in these elevations, we see the fragmentation of the prism in the name of that uh, architecture in the name of, of multiplicity, in the name of, of uh, desire for variety and uh, um, yeah, uh, for, for what a multitude means. Yeah, here is the, the uh, orange cube. This is not by him. This is by Jacob and McFarlane, uh, two interesting architects. They are partners and, and I think they are married. They were students at SciArc. And in one year, they received the, the, the prize of uh, being the best architecture office in, uh, in France. I had the chance to have a dialogue with uh, uh, Brendan McFarlane for one hour and a half through Skype from Sala Frescelor in Bucharest. We had five people in Sala Frescelor very eager to learn about um, Brendan McFarlane. Good architects. And this is an excellent building by them. And you can see the building by Jean Nouvel is very close to, they also built a green one, kind of similar to the, the orange one. But even here we see the ornamental, the embroidered elevation that sometimes um, Jean Nouvel uses as well. One Central Park, Sydney, a work in Australia, uh, extravagant, extravagant because of this 
huge cantilever parts <clears throat> which are supposed to apparently to reflect light into a garden, into a sunken garden in the proximity. But I think that beyond these, uh, you know, rational explanations is, is uh, that's why I said that not always, in my opinion, uh, Jean Nouvel is uh, avoiding a certain level of, uh, you know, uh, doing certain things for the sake of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, a show, uh, you know, I mean, these are very expensive and extravagant gestures. If he truly wanted to give light to the plants, and we are going to see in a section, uh, you know, there are gardens. But look, in order to have light reflected here in the sunken, sunken garden, you know, he creates this very, very, uh, you know, uh, expensive thing. And not only expensive, but I would say even threatening visually. Um, I'm not very sure that uh, he knows the possible consequences of all his architectural gestures. Um, I hope to be able to explain better if I see the, uh, the section through the building. On the other hand, he used the services of someone, an architect or an artist who brings uh, veg the vegetation vertically on the, on the walls of the buildings this is done now by, by all, I almost said many people. It's fashionable now to bring the, once we cut down the forests of the world, uh, we bring now the forests back on the facade of the walls of the buildings. I'm not sure this is uh, showing truly respect for nature. This is the man, Patrick Blanc, creates world's tallest vertical garden for Jean Nouvel's Sydney Tower. The vertical garden. Is the garden truly meant to be vertical? Are we truly asking that vegetation what it feels? Or are we asking ourselves what the vegetation might feel? You know, in, in my opinion, it's an imposition on nature. We are still manipulating nature in a controlling way. And I'm not sure at all that this shows that modesty that uh, probably we should have in the relationship with nature is still controlling nature. And um, uh, in, in an almost abusive way, I would say, all for the sake of the human being. Uh, I'm not sure this is the way to go at all. You know, uh, to me, this is not a respect for nature. It's not, we are, we are forcing nature to grow against its uh, natural way of being for our own pleasure. But uh, to be honest with you, I would not like to be a blade of grass on this vertical part of this building. No, I wouldn't. But <laughs> you would probably say, wait a minute, sir, you are not a blade of grass. Well, I'm not, but uh, sometimes I wish I was, but not here, not in this way, no. So I, although I admire Jean Nouvel and I consider him probably the best European architect and one of the best in the world, I have some question marks about sometimes about his works. Yes, this is, uh, you know, it, it catches your eye. You cannot be indifferent, but it's a little bit superfluous. If you think about it, the magnitude of the constructive effort for what? You know, if he truly wanted to bring sunlight to some flowers here, he should have designed differently. Uh, anyway, that's how he designed. And of course, you see a lot of plants and uh, joyous flowers in the balconies. But in essence, all these so-called joyous flowers are enslaved by the human being, the architect and the developer and so on. The renderings are nice. I like the renderings very much. You know, they are mysterious, especially, you know, against a black background, you know, the, the prism, the emphatic prism of the building is uh, diluted, is, um, you know, uh, losing almost its identity uh, because of the colorfulness of, of, the, uh, of the covering, you know, the, the plants and so on. 
but in essence, if you look beyond the appearance, you realize that actually nature is obliged to uh, so to be subvert, sub, subvert how to say to to be uh, to serve man in a position from a position of also almost humility. You see here in the section, you know, he does this thing, all this. I mean, with this probably he could have built some social housing somewhere. You know, all this in order to have, you know, the sunlight, the sun ray goes like this, goes like this, and then goes like this because he sunk some, uh, some plants here. No, in my opinion, he did this because it's extravagant. It looks eccentric and uh, it's something in my opinion, perverse here, you know. Again, if he loved nature, if he loved plants, if he loved the green, he should have designed in such a way that he did, didn't need this bonanza in order to bring the sunlight into a, yes, a darken, uh, darken, dark place, darkened uh, uh, garden. Uh, yes, it looks nice, but uh, it's showy, in my opinion. It is showy. And, um, I think uh, we, we, we could do better. Again, the drawings are nice because of this uh, attempt to, um, you know, uh, uh, somebody, somebody said, uh, Marco uh, Casagrande said that the ruin is, uh, is uh, you know, what you get with the work of man when it becomes nature. So here you would say, it's, it's nature which invades the building and, uh, well, it doesn't make it literally a ruin, but it, uh, at least visually, it uh, problematizes it. But this is only the appearance. The work of man is still standing uh, almost arrogantly so. The Serpentine Pavilion, I like this uh, Serpentine uh, Pavilion by him because he understood that in opposition to green is red. And because it is in a park, which is green, he made the building red. There it is, all red. And I think it works. Now, I don't know about the scale, about the volumes, about the, but the idea to, to bring redness into the greenness it's about the dialectics between nature and man or the work of man. The work is not the most organic work in the world, it's true. But uh, again, the, the, the play between red and green, uh, I think is, is, is successful. Maybe this is a little bit too aggressive here and you wonder what it is, why is it uh, like this? And, uh, but, uh, in a way, if we look at this picture, we see this tree with its uh, organic uh, growth, and here we see um, and here we see the the wall, the slanted wall of, of uh, Jean Nouvel, and we see two gestures: the divine one, the work of God, the go the work of nature, and the work of man. And the the work of man, in my opinion, is not is not sufficiently modest. He is rather arrogant, not just through the color, but also through the geometry it uses. All in all, if I am to, to comment on the dialogue between this ra uh, red uh, surface by Jean Nouvel and the tree, I would say that this still shows a little bit of an assault on the tree, on nature. The, it's also rather big, you know, I mean, it's called a pavilion, but it's a, it's a big pavilion. Usually the, the, the serpentine pavilions are not quite so big. Now, Jean Nouvel Cypress Tower has plants bursting through its walls. Again, the dialectics between man and nature. And uh, this is somehow, it, Somehow this maybe is a little more acceptable because you see 
you know, the, the handling of the nature is almost like an afterthought. He makes the prism, he, he makes the building, and then he lets the green burst through openings. But these little openings, which are um, Cartesian, they are square, small squares or larger squares. Uh, and then you have the, uh, almost the irrational uh, bursting through the rational. And uh, the irrational is in this case, the green of nature. I will show a little bit later another work by him with the windows which are not uh, square, uh, quite the opposite. All in all, what I see, I see symbols of his own psychology. He is a Frenchman of the 21st century, previously the 20th century, uh, still rooted in some kind of a rationalism, still believing somehow in the box, in Car Descartes, in uh, Cartesian systems, in systems in general, and then having as an afterthought, a desire to sabotage the systems, to break them, to um, assert different values. La liberté de la nature, maybe, the liberty, the freedom of nature, uh, or the freedom of the inner nature. Because when usually when, when we talk about nature, we only talk about the external nature, trees, grass, birds, animals, and so on, mountains. But what about the inner nature? Because we also have uh, uh, grass and trees and birds and animals and mountains within ourselves. The inner nature is also expressing itself externally through these outbursts that happen in his architecture. You know, uh, so, you know, it, it, it's a double uh, conflict the exterior one and the interior one. And, and I think he's correct in, 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 in trying to, to, to um, uh, express both, but, but uh, still somehow it's, 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 not a, it's not a peaceful dialogue. It's rather a conflict. You know, you see here, the, the, the green is still incarcerated, is imprisoned. Is so the, it's, imagine this green was a prisoner in a cell and trying to get out desperately, but only partially it succeeds. It's still controlled. Now, how you resolve the tension, the conflict between man and nature, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult question, a very difficult question. I'm not sure he totally resolved it. And then, of course, at the top of the building, uh, Lux Calme Volupte, the triumph of consumerism, of uh, pleasure, of comfort, of money, you know, to bring water there on the terrace of the building uh, requires technology, requires money, and not everybody can swim there at the top of such a building, of course, certainly not the proletarian. And then, uh, you know, the proletarian uh, taking the form of uh, grass or, 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 or uh, you know, vegetal uh, material explodes, uh, you know, uh, bursts through these little openings that the, the architect was generous to provide. But um, in this picture is, uh, you can see this in, in, in a way, I, I am sure he's aware of the, of the tensions between the work of man, the built work and the work of nature. And uh, in, in this picture, you see that the, the two-ness to use the word of Peter Eisenman uh, in, 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 of this conflict between nature and man. But all in all, if we look at the building, in essence, it's a triumph of man over nature. And yes, nature is allowed to burst a little bit through some openings. But all in all, the upper hand still belongs to, uh, to the human. The MoMA tower, this is a tower which I like. And it, I like, and it's almost completed. Uh, um, I like because he brought to New York City something I always thought that New York City has, a Gothic spirit. 
This is the tower. He, he struggled for many years, maybe 20 years, to have this building built. And it was built now after many struggles, judicial, financial, you name them. And in my opinion, it's one of the more interesting uh, skyscrapers in, in, in New York. It's not a modest skyscraper, but then could we have a modest skyscraper? I don't think so. Uh, uh, unreason uh, is illustrated through the uh, the aleatory structure or appears to be aleatory. And uh, the shape itself has some Gothic uh, uh, connotations. I like the structure also, you know, it, it's, uh, it's um, uh, imagine a spider was an architect and used geometry, but was also, you know, weaving a net. Um, it's a good work in my opinion. Um, I also have personal reasons to like it, and I will tell you about them a little bit later. He also did this tower, um, but this one was not built. Also of some Gothic, um, has some Gothic uh, uh, anxieties, if I'm to call them so, for an unidentified city. Well, I was joking. Uh, these are my exercises. I, I did these drawings with Archicad, Archicad and uh, I thought there was some similarity between his tower and, uh, and in New York and what I, I tried to do, what, what I did with, uh, with uh, playing with Archicad, an old version. Back to the, back to the tower by um, Jean Nouvel. You see the structure. It's, 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 partly embroidered, it's, it's woven. And I think this is the quality of, of his work. Uh, maybe it's not so apparent when the building is, uh, is finished, is finalized. I, show, I will show some picture during its construction. But you can see his works are very varied. You know, uh, there is a common uh, thread that runs through most of his works, but he's still capable. He's not really a signature architect. Uh, you see on the right, um, the Chrysler building, and on the left, the tower, a fragment of the tower by, uh, by Jean Nouvel. I wonder, he, as a young man, when he failed to enter the, the School of Fine Arts, did he imagine that one day he will build all over the world and uh, you know, very famous buildings, very prestigious buildings, and so on? You see, it's a question of fate, but it's also a question of, uh, of uh, provoking that fate, moving towards fate, that fate, uh, doing work which, which uh, uh, you know, could have a certain relevance and then fate smiles at you. One thousand feet, it's a, it's a tall building. And, and the structure, the rationalist would say, wait a minute, you know, uh, why did he do this like this and this like this? And, you know, it's capricious. Yes, it's capricious. It's not just logic. It's also the capriciousness of the artistic gesture. And, and the architecture should welcome sometimes to an extent what we call uh, capriciousness. It's not uh, only about reason. It's about uh, the complexity of the human soul, the complexity of the human mind, the complexity of emotions. Uh, you know, you cannot justify everything rationally. In terms of materiality of tectonics, I'm not so sure, you know, the building is still cold, a lot of metal here. Now, what do you do for this kind of tower? You know, it's, it's not really organic, it's, it's rather slick and cold. And uh, yeah, yeah, uh, 
in the, in the proximity of the building, perhaps you are not very satisfied because it is, um, in a way, this building on the left has more more uh, gentleness and uh, vibration than than this. This is, um, uh, in my opinion, it's it's. I like the silhouette of the building. I like the the way the structure uh, meanders towards the top. But uh, close to it, uh, you can tell, uh, you know, this is a, an almost an arrogant technology with huge, I mean, look, you know, the, 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 these are very, very thick and it's all metal and it's, it's I don't know, I, I, I don't think it's very gracefully done. Uh, here he is uh, because there were many problems with this tower. It took many years to be approved finally, and uh, but it was built. Now the 11th Avenue, 111th Avenue, New York City. I saw it being in a car, uh, and I liked it. Right across the street, there is a building by Frank Gehry. Uh, <laughs> I hope I don't show it because that building by Frank Gehry is not good at all. But the building by by Jean Nouvel, I liked, and I liked because I think he's good at. Uh, and look at these windows, you know, they, they assemble, it, they, they, they come together in some kind of a woven work. And, um, and uh, I, I, I like this, you know, it's, it's like a rug, it's like a tapestry done with windows. Still metallic, still glass, yes, but the, vibe, the, the, the complexity of the woven work adds something, I think, to the quality of the, of the skin of the building. It's not simplistic, quite the opposite. It could be alarming, alarmingly complex. Now the Copenhagen Concert Hall, a very different kind of work in Denmark. Look at this, you know, who would say that, you know, the same architect who did this labyrinthical woven textile work for the facade of this building in New York would do something like this, a blue cube. It's the same architect, Jean Nouvel. But even if he created, uh, yes, a, a blue cube, this blue cube is, is, uh, is, um, um, uh, is, uh, um, having a dialogue with the city through the projections and the modifications that the skin uh, allows um, through, I don't know, electronic means or so on, you see. Again, he was not happy to just create that cube. The cube, at least at night, can, uh, uh, you know, even question itself through uh, video, uh, uh, you know, arrangements or, uh, uh, you know, visual means. Uh, the interior is, you know, maybe common, you know, nothing so special about the interior with the exception perhaps of the ceiling here. But you see the same building because of, we have the technology now, of course, the question is how much an, uh, electrical energy is being used in order to create this. Well, if you are concerned with electrical energy to consume less electricity, if you are truly concerned with sustainability, with the climate change and so on, maybe, but then what do you do? This is still an architecture that celebrates, um, you know, the age of man, so to speak. And um, yeah. Now the Lucerne in the, in the Switzerland, the Lucerne Culture and Congress Center. Uh, uh, this also, even if I didn't know it was built by Jean Nouvel, I would have said it's Jean Nouvel. Why? Because of this uh, extensive uh, black uh, canopy, which uh, is uh, is. Is somehow typical of him, although we didn't see too many explicitly, but I kind of see his spirit because we have uh, the building with a certain, uh, you know, movement and variety underneath. And then he brings on the top this architectural umbrella, this huge surface, just 
just as he did at uh, Abu Dhabi, in Abu Dhabi with the Louvre Museum. He covers, he covers with something authoritarian, uh, well, you could say also protective. Well, yes, protective as well, but it, it, it's a tension here because what he has on the on the on the you know on, on earth is is a variety of human functions and then he brings on top something to um you know to to i don't know how to how to put it to calm them down or quite the opposite to control them is is this covering that comes from the top downwards that bothers me a little bit in his architecture but it, it looks spectacular because it's this huge surface, very thin. You know, you, you would almost say it's bi-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional, and it is spectacular. It's black. It's uh, it's uh, it's again geometry, the geometry of man. You don't see that actually. It's you know, it's not in two dimensions. It's three dimensions, but you don't see from from the from the earth. You don't see the its thickness. It's a very abstract play. But all in all, this is the uh, La Societe du Spectacle, you know, the society of spectacle. You know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's the apotheosis of, 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 of the human triumph. But the problem in this triumphalism is now questioned uh, seriously by the climate change, by the melting down of the icebergs, the rising levels of the seas. So, I wonder how Jean Nouvel will continue to build, and not just him, of course. Dubai Opera. This was supposed to be a very interesting work. Unfortunately, it was not built. You'll only see the project. And look at this. You don't know. I don't know. You know exactly what is going on there. It's surreal. It's mysterious. You know, it's. Uh, yeah, it's 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 like a building, uh, like a chimera. It's phantasmagoric. It's uh, covered by a fog. By look, look at this. You know, uh, it's good at this sort of thing. You know, to to bring uh, theatrics into architecture, to dramatize, to bring the baroque spirit in conjunction with the Cartesian spirit to uh, insight through theatrical means. He's a dramatic architect, he loves drama. I also think he has a pessimistic side. And in my essay on him, and again, if one of you, or if you, all of you want to read it, I can send it to you. Um, I comment on this because once he made a project, uh, La Tour Sans Fin, uh, you know, kind of uh, in terms of words, uh, making one think of uh, the endless column by Brancusi, where the building is not so much a, as, a, as a skyscraper. I mean, it is a tower, but it's, it's more like an, I called it then in that essay, an earth scraper. It came from the conceptual sky of the artist, meaning the architect, and plunged into the earth. And I, I believe he has a pessimistic side. Even here, the building, you know, dissolves itself in this, I don't know what it is, fog-like, you know, it's not a building any longer. It's almost a building which does not want to be a building, does not want to be, to begin with, does not want to exist, yet it exists. It was a very interesting project. I, I regret it was not uh, it was not built. And this uh, we already are familiar with 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 what we see here. He wanted to have something similar in Dubai as well. Well, this is also to an extent connecting with a tradition of visionary architecture in the French culture, Le Doux and Boulet. And uh, 
you know, architecture, if it is to have high standards, cannot always reject what is called the visionary. Uh, this one belongs to, uh, you know, Abu Dhabi. We saw the works, the Louvre. And here he is with Renzo Piano and his uh, young wife, uh, the second or the third wife. And uh, I don't know, I think the person on the right is, I don't know if it's the wife of Renzo Piano. Renzo Piano, Renzo Piano dresses in a very uh, non-star like way. And this, this I like actually, you know, I'm beginning to like Renzo Piano exactly because of the, of the awkwardness of the way he dresses. As opposed to Jean Nouvel, he, do, he does dress like a, a, you know, a French intellectual or French artist or New York artist, all in black. You can tell he's an artist. But, uh, but uh, you know, Renzo Piano dresses like a man who just uh, got off the train and came back from work or something, you know. And we are talking about one of the most uh, successful architects in the world, right? Anyway. I thought of showing uh, some pictures like this as well. And here he is again with his, um, with his latest wife. He had several wives, two or three. Anyway, late, they look good. And I think, uh, uh, you know, um, what can we say? You know, when you arrive at this uh, level of success, you can afford to be loved by a very young woman. And he is. Hello, Mr. Nouvel. Happy birthday to you. You are 76 years old. Uh, and uh, I forgot the name of his, uh, his wife. She must be very proud of him, of course. You know, she is the wife of uh, Jean Nouvel. Here they are again. And uh, the Mephistophelic uh, face of uh, Jean Nouvel. He loves black hats and high quality hats, that's for sure. Uh, he has many layers there. I see a coat, I see a sweater, I see a shirt, I see an undershirt, I see a scarf. Anyway, but I like his expression. He's a man who questions and who saw many things in his life. No doubt, sorry. Uh, here he is with, um, do you know the gentleman on the right? The, the gentleman on the right is uh, Richard Meyer. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the female molester, as, as he was known lately, you know, he even had to resign because of uh, the many scandals. Uh, and he is, uh, I think, uh, close to 90 or over 90. Jean Nouvel is younger, of course. And here he is again with Renzo Piano. I don't know who is the person in the middle. I imagine uh, some kind of a fashion designer, perhaps a, a famous fashion designer, but I don't know his name. Anyway, they all smile. And I like this picture. I mean, here he is, you know, Napoleon-like, of course. Now the wind helped, you know, blowing the scarf above his head. But it's a nice, uh, I think it's a nice picture. Here is the emperor saluting uh, the people. And, and here we have shoes. And I would, I, I would ask you if you could answer, if you could identify the person based on their shoes. He is on this picture too. But there are, I think we have only Pritzker Prize laureates in this picture. Uh, so it's a very select uh, group of people. Let's see who they are. So let's take a last look at the, at, at the shoes. The shoes do say something about, uh, about human beings. Now you probably recognize this person because he has his shirt coming out of his pants, which for a Pritzker Prize laureate is not very, uh, very common. But this can only be uh, Aravena, of course. And Aravena is on the left, Christian de Portson Park. Next, Wang Shu from Amateur Architecture. Renzo Piano at the center, Aravena, and of course, Jean Nouvel. 
My question to the Romanian is, Romanians is, when are we going to have a Romanian here? Yes, for patriotic reasons. When? Because this kind of shoes we can find ourselves and they don't look very expensive, do they? If you look at the shoes, you wouldn't say these are the shoes of Pritzker Price Laureates, right? Well, they all are. Anyway, bravo to them. And let's move now to one new change building in London. This is an interesting building because it's a department store. It's a mall. That's what it is. It is a mall. And uh, in the proximity of uh, St. Paul Cathedral uh, by uh, um, uh, Sir uh, Christopher Wren. Uh, and I will, I will say why this is interesting. Because you look at the building and it has this rift, this opening into the building. It's a large commercial building. That's what it is. Let's have no illusions. But there is a dialogue with the church. The church is here. Uh, and you'll understand what it is about very soon. This shows that, 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 that Nouvelle, even when he built a mundane building, didn't neglect the context. And the context was that is across the street from the most important cathedral in London. Here is the cathedral and you see there is actually a cross, an opening. You'll see a conceptual sketch of the building. He opened that, it, it, it is as if uh, some kind of an emanation coming out of uh, St. Paul Cathedral was, was cutting through the mundanity, the mundane building by, uh, uh, by Jean Nouvel. Uh, maybe I didn't explain well, but you'll understand when we'll see other pictures. So this is the rift, the cut through the building. And here you see, this is the cathedral, right, with the dome. And then you see that if you prolong, if, if the center of the building by Nouvelle is here, and you connect this center with the edges of the dome, you get exactly this opening into his uh, large mall. So this rift, this break, this uh, erosion into the building is a clear homage uh, it's more than an homage. It's, uh, I mean, it's so obvious the, 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 in a way, almost the hierarchy of values. Because here is God, is the house of God, is the cathedral. And this is the house of man, the house of fashion, the house of consumerism. And the house of God, the rays of God, the rays of the cathedral cut through the building. And uh, this was not done accidentally, it's obvious. He's a subtle architect, he's a thinking architect. He thinks, and it's not, you know, uh, most architects would have just built a, you know, a more or less skillful, uh, skillfully done uh, uh, mold. No, this man thinks, this man feels, this man understands the, 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 the context, both physical and metaphysical, of an architectural gesture. You see clearly here the cathedral and his building. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I admire him for this. He assumes the, 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 the mundane. He doesn't turn his back on it. He doesn't say, I, I, I am only doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, works which are not uh, commercial. No, he assumes the commercial. But then, like in this case, he also uh, shows us that he's aware of other things beyond commerce. And there is even a cross here, you know, uh, the circulation. It's a distorted cross. And the center that connects with the, with the dome uh, here is right here within the building. So I think, I think again, uh, Jean Nouvel shows his ability to connect between his architecture and what is around uh, his architecture, both physically and metaphysically, as, as I said. And you see here, when you exit 
the mall, you see clearly the cathedral. Sir Christopher Wren, the best, the largest, the biggest cathedral, the most important cathedral in London. In a way, we have here the conjunction between the sacred and the profane, to use the title of a book by Mircea Eliade. That's what we have, left and right, the mundane, meaning the profane, and right here, the sacred, the cathedral and the mall. It is exactly because of this that his work uh, avoids uh, almost the unavoidable, because the almost unavoidable would have been excessive mundanity. It's a mundane building, uh, I'm sure, uh, with expensive uh, items here and so on. But because of this cut into the body of the building, he shows that there are other values besides those of, uh, of the mundane world. It's clear, God and man, and then the cut into the body of the work of man because of the awareness that here there is something that we cannot neglect. Interesting work because of this. And look at the, the sketch. It shows clearly the dialogue with the, with the, with the cathedral. Almost a, an, an anxious dialogue. It's not just a dialogue between two buildings. It's a dialogue between two realities, the mundane one, the prosaic one, the profane one, and the sacred one. Hello, Mr. Nouvel. Happy birthday to you again. I will send you the recording. <laughs> Don't be sad that you are not here, please. OK, moving forward. Hello, Mr. Christopher Wren. Well, this was before the, the pandemic. Cutting the red ribbon. And here he is as a young man <laughs> with a seductive smile, of course. Uh, it would be hard not to fall in love with this man. I mean, this is the, the quintessential French smile of a young man who doesn't care too much. He's losing some hair. He has the inner power and creativity to um, aspire towards higher realms, and he did achieve them. Now, do you know who this one is? <laughs> this is not Jean Nouvel. I don't know what he's doing here in this presentation. Anyway, this is Frank Gehry as a young man. Um, <laughs> the architect who irritates Kenneth Frampton beyond measure. Now, this is what he said, Jean Nouvel, the best engineer a few decades ago was someone who could create the most beautiful beam or structure. Today it's to do a structure you cannot see or understand how it's done. It disappears and you can talk only about color, symbols and light. It's an aesthetic of miracles. This is what he said. We can uh, debate what he said, but that's what he said. And I imagine that's what he thinks. Another picture of him questioning both maybe himself and the world and uh, dressed well as opposed to Renzo Piano. And here he is in a showy posture, you know, like uh, L'Homme Revolté of uh, Albert Camus, but uh, dressed uh, impeccably from, uh, you know, uh, high fashion magazine. Now, this is a work which I don't like. The new police headquarters in Charleroi in Belgium. I don't like it because again, I see his flirtation with power. I understand that the police uh, with words or without words represents power, authority. But why did he have to express it so crushingly? I mean, you know, uh, you know th these are just, uh, you know, uh, representations of the facade 
but uh, the building itself is crashing. It's phallic, it's huge, and, and it's just, in my opinion, it's a mistake to make such a phallic tower the headquarters of a police, um, you know, a, a police in a, I don't know how large of a city, but, but I would not have done it in any city like this. Really, I, I don't understand. I, I think he could do better. You know, it, it's, it's, it's alarming. And I see this side in him, which, which bothers me, you know, it is, uh, he's supposed to love the people, uh, vulnerabilities, fragilities, Geometry too, but not the police, not to express, not to serve, uh, you know, those in power with such an emphatic, uh, you know, overwhelming tower. Um, I don't know why I show, I know what that work is, but let's, let's look again at this, uh, in my opinion, architectural mistake. It is a mistake. You know, this is not uh, uh, the divine tower. This is not the tower of, of the divine power. This is the, the tower of the police. And uh, if I had to, <clears throat> if I had business to do in this building, I would go towards it trembling. That's how I would go. But he, he did other phallic towers, uh, in my opinion, <clears throat> of a questionable taste. Now here, uh, I don't know. I don't know why I showed his uh, shadow here. Uh, I guess I like this picture. Now here he is uh, at uh, Fondation Cartier in Paris. I have seen this building, which I like. I like because he is able in this building to to um, to uh, dilute the frontier between the work of man, meaning the building that he built, and and and, and nature. But uh, I don't know, let, let me just, yeah, we will arrive at it. I just anticipated a little bit. He said, I guess he said architecture is only a movie. I'm not sure about this. Sometimes architects make uh, statements which are not very rigorous, uh, but this is a picture of Fondation Cartier uh, in, in Paris. And now we see the building. It, it was built not around the time when he built, maybe a little bit later, from uh, l'Institut du Monde Arabe. It's a steel and glass structure, but he's able to, to really negotiate with, uh, with, between the inside and outside in very ambiguous terms. Not so much in this picture because this picture shows the top of the building, but at the level of the eye, it's under certain, certain conditions of light. You don't know any longer where the tree is, where the wall is, where the glass is. It's very interesting. Uh, like here, you know, you're a little bit confused. Where is the inside? Where is the outside? What is reflected? What is seen through? Uh, it's a famous uh, art foundation. I hope one of you will have an exhibition there uh, one day. Um, yes, it is a Cartesian building, but because of the materials he use, uses and because of the proportions and the, the you know the the windows and so on, it's 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 not uh, it has a level of ambiguity. Now, Expo Zero Two Switzerland. This is a work which, in my opinion, shows both his pessimism and a little bit maybe his even cynicism. You know, a heavy cube of rusted iron floating on, 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 uh, on, on, on water. I like it, but it's impossible for me not to think about the end of life, of Thanatos, of death. You know, it's, it's like a, you know, a structure that, uh, that uh, uh, refers to death but it's floating on, 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 on the lake, on, on, on water. A cube, the cube of man, the cube of Euclid, the cube of, of, of geometry in rusted iron, heavy like hell, floating uh, on, uh, on water. It's an, ominous, uh, it's an ominous figure, actually. I like it, but uh, it is ominous. And it is clear to me that, that Jean Nouvel is not unaware of the limits of life, to put it very gently. 
it's an interesting work, I would say, and it invites to philosophical uh, speculation. It's so very different from Teatro del Mundo by Aldo Rossi, which is light in spirit, floating. This is, this is not light in spirit. This is, uh, uh, it is ominous in my opinion. Now Onyx sent uh, her blame in France, a black building, uh, but different from what we saw earlier, although the geometry is strict. And sometimes his buildings do use a strict geometry, even the plan is uh, a square and it's, uh, it's symmetrical in good measure. It's a you know, place for a theater. It even writes on it, theater. In essence, the building is not dramatic, but because of the, uh, you know, uh, just like in Copenhagen, you remember the blue cube, because of the interventions on the skin of the, of the, of the cube, uh, things become like here, you know, it's, 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 it is theatrical, although the building in terms of volume is not a playful volume, it's a cube. But, but this facade cannot leave you indifferent, you know, with those white circled, uh, you know, um, uh, you wonder what they are. Are they a reference to the, um, to the, you know, the spectacle, the eye. Now, Torre Akbar in Barcelona, we know it, everybody knows it. I, personally, I don't like it. It's, it's too obviously masculinist, kind of like the police headquarters in that Belgian town. Uh, yes, he tries to, uh, you know, work a little bit with the skin uh, and uh, bring some lyricism to it. But in essence, it's a very imposing masculinist uh, architectural presence. Very much so. I don't think Jean Nouvel is at, at his best when he does this sort of thing. Yes, he's not a perfect circle. Yes, he uses some color, but all in all, it's, it's, it's an imposing uh, and uh, intruding presence in the social, fa in the fabric of, of the city of Barcelona. I'm surprised Barcelona built it. I like this. I like the fact that he, uh, I put uh, the, the way I put it problematizes the, the, the skin through color. This is good, I think, but he's still unable to uh, um, question the, the, the arrogance of the geometry he uses through those pictorial bidimensional, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, interventions. Now I understand, is architecture supposed to be an expression of power or is architecture supposed to be an expression of power and sensitivity and vulnerability and fragility? If it's only an expression of power, in my opinion, it's not, uh, it's not achieving what it's supposed to achieve. Now the question would be, what about the great, uh, you know, uh, buildings built uh, under, you know, a king, uh, an emperor, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of temples. Um, I, I think we should talk about this uh, some other time, but in my opinion, this building is, uh, is, um, is not communicating enough with the city in, uh, in uh, harmonious ways. It's, it, it is, uh, uh, lonely gesture uh, of, of expressing power, but, but this power condemns it to, to solitude. And I think this is a problem. Plus the shape itself is rather aggressive in my opinion. It's almost like a giant bullet. I'm not talking about the biological, uh, you know, resemblances and so on, but it's also the military resemblance, which worries me. Just like in the, in the headquarter, the building in Belgium. Now another skyscraper, this one I like, but it was not built. 
But this one I like because in this case, you see the tower is a little bit uh, lowering its head, so to speak. The windows are, um, you know, uh, placed in, a, in, a, in an aleatory manner on the, on the building. The, the, the exterior of the building is not uh, arrogantly, uh, you know, uh, conceived. It's, 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 it's more organic, this tower. I regret he didn't build it. I think it would have been a better tower. Yes, it's still a tower. Yes, it's still vertical, but but, but here he's he was able to evoke at least uh, a sense of uh, uh, potential vulnerability, and I think that is a quality. But uh, he didn't build it, but I like it. La Marseillaise. Uh, you can see I play myself with the with the with the colors red, white, and fro and and, uh, and frogs and blue. French architect Jean Nouvel has completed an office skyscraper in Marseille with a concrete facade painted in twenty seven shades of red, white, and blue in celebration of the port city's landscape. Well, it's not just the landscape; it's the Marseillaise, for God's sake, is the national uh, hymn of France. It's patriotic here. It's not just about, uh, and that's why it's called the Marseillaise. It's not just about the landscape. While the blue is meant to represent the city sky, the red is intended to mimic the hue of city's rooftops, 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 and the white is supposed to reference the color of the rock on massive that Calonk, a stretch of rugged coastline that runs from Marseille towards the town of Cassis. But you see this, this text, which I didn't write, refers to the physical context. It's also the metaphysical context. It's the flag of France. That's what it is, red, white, and blue. Towers all over the world look too alike. They often appear interchangeable. They could exist anywhere, explained Nouvelle. They rarely describe the city. They are tall but anonymous. My tower is singular. Its ambition is to belong clearly to the dense Mediterranean sea air. That's what he, that's what he wrote. So I guess it's his uh, unrealized uh, dream of becoming a painter that uh, you know, he employs in his building sometimes. And uh, I, think, uh, I think he's successful. Uh, although some might comment on, on, uh, on uh, uh, you know, this pictorial means through which he problematizes the work of the architect. But I would disagree with that. Now he even designed uh, and built uh, a park in Barcelona, maybe in some kind of a competition with uh, Antoni Gaudi, with the Guel Park, a very different park from, uh, from uh, Gaudi's um, work. Uh, and uh, it's still a work in progress, I would say. Uh, I don't know at the time when I made the presentation, I had available these pictures. Uh, I imagine in time, uh, you know, uh, nature uh, develops and the park together with it. But it's interesting that he also assumed uh, the, the role of being a landscape designer. And we see here these erosions in the gate, just as we saw them in the tower where nature was bursting through the walls, the white walls. These openings, irregular as they are, these uh, fragmentations within the, 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 the body of the gate show to me a little bit, again, his awareness of the limits of life, that is death. Uh, they are, they are, uh, he anticipates through this what will happen inevitably, the ruin. Uh, and uh, and uh, you see here uh, as well. I wish he, I, I wish he used in his project uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi for the Louvre something like this at the edge. I think it would have been better. Um, anyway. And here, the, the, uh, through, through the presence of absence, uh, through these openings, irregular openings, he also uh, uh, shows his ability to become ornamental, 
and uh, thus uh, showing that he is not a dogmatic modernist. The opening in this dome also I like because it's irregular. So it, it, uh, it fights off the predictability and centrality of the dome, you know, and I like the fact, when, I like it when, when, when he's able to see both ways, so to speak. So this is in Barcelona, uh, Jean Nouvel. I regret he didn't use ceramic works in some kind of an homage to uh, Parguel, to Antoni Gaudi. I think ceramics would have added something to this park. Maybe he will. Here he is with a with the mayor of Barcelona. Well, his architecture is pixelated architecture, you know, this we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, hide, but uh, these uh, openings, pixelated openings uh, show some kind of a longing for something more organic, I would say, and also an anticipation uh, about the workings of time. The Fira Hotel, another work in Barcelona, here the window, is an event and a very eccentric event. I mean, just imagine an architect proposing such an opening into the wall of a, of, of a contemporary building. It's almost incredible. And he did it, it was built. But we see the same dialectics between reason, the Cartesian spirit and nature. Here, we don't see the leaf of the tree uh, in a figurative way. I mean, it is figurative, but we don't see the plant. We see the spirit of the plant uh, manifested through the configuration of the opening. Who would have thought of such an adventurous opening into the wall of, uh, of a hotel? Well, Jean Nouvel. And uh, the, the, the return of nature here happens as well. I wish I had more pictures of this, but anyway, this uh, iconic window is hard to forget. And it was done by Jean Nouvel in uh, Barcelona. Now you can see it here. It's still controlled, it's still, uh, but still the, the window is, I think, uh, very, very interesting. And interesting is also what is happening here at this level. I have to do more research on this project. Now we, we arrive at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we are approaching the end of the presentation. This is a, a work which is again, uh, Jean Nouvel, because it is audacious in its uh, attempt to, to, to uh, break the box. Here he breaks the box in this way with this, uh, you know, audacious uh, cantilever. You might like it, you might not like it, but here is a, a special, even here is not, it's not, it's not just a uh, tour de force for the sake of uh, showing off, uh, you know, uh, the technological proudness it's an homage to the landscape, and I will explain why. It's the frontier between two states uh, in, uh, in the United States. So from here, you can contemplate. Uh, it's also a river. So it, it's, 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 it's at the edge uh, between, between two states. Otherwise, yes, it's like the blue cube in uh, Copenhagen. It's a theater, and it's a famous theater uh, whose name belongs to a very important um, uh, theater personality, Mr. Guthrie, who said something memorable. I only know one quotation from Guthrie. He said, 
the genius is the one who does everything except what is necessary. And I like this. <laughs> Uh, from, from this point of view, I uh, could uh, I could uh, have the illusion that I might have certain qualities myself, because I also like to do what is not necessary. Like these presentations, for example, nobody asks me to do these presentations every day. Here is Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, the great, great, great Russian uh, playwright uh, who died young at 40 something and a very interesting man. He was supporting himself through writing, but he was a doctor and he was providing for free medical services while he was supporting himself as a writer. Usually it's the opposite. You know, you cannot make money with writing and you sustain yourself with being a doctor. In this case it was the very opposite. Too bad he, was died, he died so young. But uh, when you see a play by Chekhov, go that it is Pescarusul or, uh, you know, in Romanian, uh, he has all uh, uh, three, uh, three, sorority, three sisters, a great, 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 great uh, playwright, one of the greatest. And this is probably Bernard Shaw on the left, and I don't know who is here. Anyway, culture, theater, building, Jean Nouvel, can deliver the path towards uh, contemplating the frontier between two states in the United States. The interior, of course, had to, had, had to be read. It has to be read because it has to do with theater. He also built in Lyon, an uh, addition to the opera building, he recreated it also with redness. Redness is, is uh, intrinsically connected with, uh, with uh, the art of the, of the spectacle, of the theater. I hope I have an image from where, where the number 12 is. Um, so you'll understand it. It's not just a, you know, a futile a gesture, uh, you know, having no justification at all. It, it, it has a justification, but uh, I don't yet see that picture. Yeah, from here, because you can contemplate from here the the water and the, the, the as I said, the frontier between two states. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, it's, uh, it's um, almost a meditation place you know, a contemplative place from where you can admire not only the beauty of the landscape, but also the, the significance, uh, administrative and ge uh, geographical uh, significance of, uh, of the placing of this building. Like you see this person, you know, she's contemplating from here begins, here is another state and the river is in between two states and from here, from this uh, audacious cantilever part, you can contemplate this, uh, you know, reality of this particular place. So just like in London, where we saw the dialogue with uh, St. Paul Cathedral, here we see a dialogue with the edge of the, of the state and uh, the frontier between two states. So again, Jean Nouvel often, if not always, often is sensitive to the context physical and I would say even metaphysical within which he builds. Now the National Museum of Qatar in Doha, Doha this is one of his early, uh, latest works and is a work I admire. And I will tell you why. Uh, first of all, it's a shocking work. Here he welcomes uh, chains. Let's give chains a chance. And uh, he inspired himself from this uh, rose, uh, desert rose. Uh, um, it's, it's kind of like kind of a dry plant in that area, not just in, uh, in Doha. Uh, and you look at this, and then you look at his building. And again, you know, he's able to transform suggestions coming either from the culture of a place or the physical, natural realities of a place 
into into something that he builds and uh, courageously so i mean it takes one with courage to do something like this doesn't it you know you you need you 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 need tremendous courage and the ability to use that courage to crystallize uh, you know convincingly a building this is a building that until it came into being would not have been even imagined and he he not only that he imagined it he built it so again architecture deserves its name when it is an adventure and in this case it was an adventure uh, yes a very expensive adventure you will see pictures of the of the of the construction process which are some of them impressive if something bothers me here is the rather placid um, chromatics of, of the building the in my opinion as opposed to the uh, philharmonic uh, philharmonia in paris where there are uh, vibrations there are uh, you know various uh, uh, kinds of grays and there is uh, the, 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 the texture of the of the skin of the building is uh, not monochromatic here it is monochromatic maybe he did uh, he meant to have these fragments also uh, polyphonic if i could say so they are not at this point because it's just the, the monochromatic work but maybe who knows in in the future i hope something will happen and uh, and uh, the building would be not just an extravagant uh, conjunction of uh, unbelievable uh, volumes and forms but also get something from nature from you you saw you know uh, here what he did is a little bit artificial and dry and almost sterile, but in terms of shapes, is interesting. Another um, uh, reticence I have is that he uses again here, just like in the case of the, the Abu Dhabi building, the circle. Uh, the circle. Here we don't have the circle. We don't have circles. Now, maybe it, I, it would have been very difficult for him to to arrive at this level of organicity. You know, here we don't have circles. We have these shapes that are, that are natural, they are organic. Uh, well, that's not what he has. He has here, all of these are circles. And I think it's a problem with this, but otherwise I think the, the building is, uh, is, uh, is remarkable. And is remarkable because it says yes to, to ale the aleatory uh, arrangement of forms and volumes. It's it's surprising. It's uh, it's um, you know, uh, uh, and it connects, I would say, with the disorder of what we might understand by the bazaar. Now, look during the construction. Uh, you know, it was tremendous effort here, of course. Um, you know, all these planes done with steel and, uh, you know, the coordination of all this work because, you know, a, I mean, you know, the, the, the effort was tremendous. Again, it bothers me, but you know what is the relevance that it bothers me? I'm just telling you what I think. These should not have been perfect circles. They should have been, but probably would have been very, very difficult to have the edges not uh, so geometrically configured. It would have been very difficult, perhaps. Anyway, uh, nevertheless, it's an interesting work. And uh, bravo to him and bravo to, to the people in Doha who built it. Um, Yes, I, I wish the level of organicity was higher. 
but maybe it was not possible. Or maybe these are the limits of Jean Nouvel because we have seen these limits also in Abu Dhabi and in some other cases. Although I think he's capable of, 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 of moving away from, uh, from excessive control. But sometimes, like here, as I said, the circle, in my opinion, is used uh, uh, to um, self-consciously. When I look at this, I like, because I, I don't see the circle. I see the fragmentations. Maybe it's disorienting, I understand. Uh, uh, but, but, but this being said, we do have to acknowledge the unbelievable adventure, architectural adventure he engaged in. Well, he was capable of doing this because he was already Jean Nouvel and uh, you know, he had the, the, the necessary credits uh, in his favor. But still, there are successful architects who do not take risks as he does. So he's a man who understands that art, and including uh, include here architecture, uh, is uh, is an explorative realm, and uh, should uh, should uh, uh, should uh, be accordingly, uh, as I said, an adventure. Yeah, they, they, this, I know I, I can become obsessive now, but uh, I so regret these are circles. Uh, in the section and, you know, at the level of the eye, maybe you don't see it, uh, but from above you do see it. Sorry about the resolution of these, uh, of these drawings. I think a good work is a conjunction between order and disorder. And here we do have order and disorder, but somehow, um, yes, the disorder is present, but I think the order is a little bit too artificial because of the um, uh, uh, multiplication of, a cert of, of, of the circular geometry, which is too obvious. Um, it's, I don't think it's subtle enough, but otherwise it's still a, 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 a very interesting work. I wonder what the people in Doha, uh, you know, feel and think about this building. I, I, I imagine they adopted it and they like it. Why not? Sure. back to the source of inspiration for, uh, for uh, Jean Nouvel. And here he is, uh, the, uh, when he received the, the Pritzker Prize. Thank you and happy birthday, uh, Jean Nouvel. <laughs>